aspect of Christianity, including the Nicene one, where the famous creed was created, they all took place in the lands of modern Turkey. And many Catholics strongly believe that Mother Mary spent her last days in Ephesus and a scandalous sky, and Apostle John, who later on, the writer of the final gospel, when he came to Ephesus, he brought Mother Mary through the here, and there's an area called House of Mother Mary, which is so venerated and respected by the Catholic community. And the first written parts and the final chapters of the whole New Testament was written in Ephesus with the letters of Paul, which are the first things, and the Gospel of John, which is the final chapter, and they were all completed. And that gives a lot of importance, especially if you're a Bible lover, when you walk on the streets of Ephesus, you feel this why coming up as well. And of course, Turkey is the lens of the Turks at the end, because we Turks arrived here in 11th century AD and have been living here in the last millennium. And during the time they created an amazing empire called Ottomans, which was today known as the fifth largest empire in the world history, spread it over three continents and almost like an, uh, 7 million uh, square miles territory. But when you come to modern Turkey, after the First World War, uh, Republic of Turkey just emerged from this turmoil in 1923 with the great leadership of our legendary founding father, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the guy you see on the picture as well. When you look at the modern Turkey, ladies and gentlemen, we're a very mixed society. And it's a kind of society ethnically very mixed, religiously very mixed, and religion is just used as an idea for many people. Although we have a conservative government and we have a kind of interesting president, which we really intend to send them away in elections in the next two years, uh, people are not really like an crazily religious in our country. Let me describe it in a different way. First of all, we're ethnically we're a mix. Only 40% of the country, they define themselves as really Turks, but like, and we got Greeks, Jews, Russians, Poles, Yugoslavians, Romanians, Albanians, Armenians, and the biggest minority group, Kurds. And plus, of course, we never take them into consideration as a population, but we still have almost 4 million Syrian refugees and 1 million Afghan refugees. Turkey is the number one in country in the world. And why we're number one? With having the highest number of refugees. None of the world countries has such a high number of refugees like us. We just kind of like an act, hey, join us. We can take care of you well. I hope we'll be successful. And religiously, almost 94% of country are predominantly Muslim. Very small amount of Jews, but we have a lot of like a, Assyrian Christians, Armenian Apostolic Church members, and we have also some Coptic Christians living in Turkey as well. And also a ecumenical patriarchate of Greek Orthodox Church is located in Istanbul. Many people just tell me, so Mert, if you get a 90% Muslim population, oh, do we have to cover our heads all the time? Better not just say hi again and wave your hand. And almost 65% of the women, they don't cover themselves. You see more ladies on the mini skirts with high heels with genuine fake Louis Vuitton bags in their hands and strolling on the streets. And it, yeah, Islam is kind of like a more identity than the practice itself. And it's also interesting Muslim society where drinking is a daily habit. You know how they call the Turks? Irish of the Middle East. That's a kind of like a term they use for the Turks as well. And it's kind of like a cheerful people. We are respectful and we're tolerant with each other as well. That's the, I think the balance we created quite well in this country. Turkey is highly populated, especially if you compare with Canada, my Canadian friends, 
we are really, really a crowded country. Our population without the refugees is eight, almost 85 million. Istanbul is reaching up to 20 million and nowadays. Second major city is in the heart of the country and also is the administrative capital called Ankara, which was established by Celts, by the way, in the sixth century BC. Celts? You mean Irish people? Kind of, yeah. Celts were originated from the north of the Caspian Sea. And before they reached the northwest of the France, the Breton area, they passed from the Asia Minor and some of them stayed and settled down and leave. And city of Ankara comes from that period. And the third major city is Izmir with almost 5 million, which is the biblical Smyrna. And almost 50% uh, of the country uh, live in a six major cities and then the rest of the 50% spread it through the rest of the world. By the way, Turkey is also a quite large country in a European scale. Yeah, we're not large like Canada or United States, but in a European scale, we are the largest country. The best way to describe, you guys know the size of Texas quite well. Put the whole Texas here, not enough. You can add at least the half of California to the top of Texas, but please add the northern parts. I love the northern California a little bit more. And then you can get the size of Turkey. In a European scale, whole France plus Spain and Portugal is approximate size of modern Turkey. And Turkey is very young country, ladies and gentlemen. And 65%, I mean it, are under 35 years old. And with the age 50, I'm one of the senior <laughs> citizens in this country. It's quite funny, but that's true. Uh, people always ask me, Mark, what's the reason? In late 80s, early 90s, this is the country we experienced a stagflation, a financial crisis. During those years, or inflation rate was around the 400% per year. Today we get 15% inflation and we just say, hey, this is the end of the world. No, come on. I was brought up, I was in the college when all this 400% inflation happened in this country. And of course what happened, people get stuck in their home. They didn't go out too much till the early 2000s and then guess what happened? that trigger a big boom in the population of Turkey. And the fifth, almost 50% are under 25 years old. So related with that, what kind of education we have in this country? Ladies and gentlemen, education is compulsory in Turkey for 12 years. And even you may have a handicapped kid, you may have an autistic kid, doesn't matter. You are required to send your kids, but we get the schools for everyone. We get the schools for handicapped kids. We get the, probably the best schools for kids who has autism in Europe. We really provide a quite good service with that. And first four year, all the kids, they see the same teacher. First four year, they all study with the same teacher. And after that second four and the third four, they studied with the specialization teachers as well. Almost 90% of the schools are public, which means state subsidized, you pay nothing, and 10% are private. And after that, ladies and gentlemen, in the 12th grade, all the high school students, they enter, they take a special SAT test. Those SAT is a little bit, but unlike the US and Canadian system, is only once in a year, and then roughly 1.2 million students, they take this test and according to their score, they can apply to universities. In Turkey universities, the total number of universities are almost 500, 120 of them are state universities. We call them public universities in Turkey and the rest are the private universities and colleges. If you go and attend the public universities and private universities in Turkey, the deal is same like in Canada and US. Tuition starts from seven, 8,000 US dollars, goes up to there are two, three universities, private universities, their tuitions are like a 20,000 US dollars per year. But if you get accepted by public university, your yearly tuition, including dorm, 
food and all the publications and books, something around 250 US dollars per year. So you can see that actually state really subsidized the education even in higher levels. And ladies get ready because almost 60% of the all undergrad master and PhD students are women in my country. As a senior citizen, nearly almost 50, in last 25, 30 years, I can see the big rising power of women in this country. Not only two goddesses, you can see Alma Mater and Afrid Artemis at the top. You can see there's some modern popular ladies. I put their pictures specifically, especially the lady in the up left. Her name is Güler Sabancı. She is the CEO of the, the largest conglomerate in Turkey. Almost 200,000 people work for her and she controls almost 40 billion US dollar revenue. The lady underneath of the, or big business lady is Elif Shafak. She is the one of the most popular writers and she is one of the nominees of the Oscar literacy, the Nobel literacy prize. And she writes first in English and then translates to Turkish. The lady with the headscarf she was the wife of the former president. The others are famous singer, military lady, and some other popular ladies in the Turkish media and athletes as well. So that's something we're really, really proud. And in last elections, which took place two years ago, almost 22% of the Turkish parliament's seats occupied by ladies. So this number is higher than nearly all the countries in Europe's parliaments if you compare the Turkish parliament with them. What is the economy? Right now, not good. It's tumbling uh, since 2018. There are a couple of reasons. Number one, we had a kind of problem with the president Trump and he triggered a kind of financial crisis for a currency wise. And the second major thing is of course the COVID. Whole tourism stopped after the COVID and also related with the tourism, textile industry and agricultural industries slow down. But although all these negative drawbacks, Turkey is still the 18th largest economy in the world. And we're the member of G20 and we're still like a surviving and doing because the one of the main reason, ladies and gentlemen, we still do manufacturing. And unemployment rate is right now around the 14%, but three, four years ago in non-COVID period, that was roughly around the uh, 12% as well. Yes, Elif Shafak is the right of the name of the writer. And I will tell her some English books. You can find them in a different way as well. Just for a second, I'm coming. Excuse me, unexpected visitor. And related to that, what are the major industries? And number one, and the most important one is textile. Turkey, eh, where the real top quotes of wool, cotton, linen, leather, and silk producers. Turkish silk, according to Chinese masters, they say, wow, this is something we need to learn how to get those kind of good quality of silk as well. And we do like a kind of all industrial textile, fabrics, carpets, mats, house decorations, so many products. And in terms of quality, we are like a quality wise, we're number one, quantity wise, we're number two. But the second largest industry is car, automotive production. And in some years we're number one, some years we're number two. I think one of the major reasons for that is Germany especially is shifting all the big car productions through the Turkey. Toyota has been building in starting from 2019. They have been building the world largest car plantations in the south of city of Ankara. So why they're coming to Turkey to produce cars? Two reasons. From Turkey, it's easy to deliver to Europe, African, Asia at the same time. Second thing, we have good engineers, 
and relatively cheap labors, they are the really right combinations for that. And as a big country, we have the world's most lovely neighbors. In the South, we have the Syria, and then we have the Iraq, and then we got the Iran, and then we got the two buffer countries, Azerbaijan and Armenia, three, and Georgia, but behind them, we got a Russia. So imagine that we need to protect ourselves. And that's why military is something very important for Turkish culture. And every Turkish man in the age of 20, if they're not college kids, they are required to join the military for 18 months. If they're a college kid, uh, when they completed their education, they have to join the after maybe master, maybe even the PhD, again for 15 months, but three months officership training, and then whole 12 months as an officer in a Turkish military forces. This is something very important for Turkish culture. There's no compulsory military service for ladies. But if the lady says, no, we want to join, they're also welcome, but they can join as either officers or non-commissioned officers. And it's a kind of professional job for them. For example, me, myself, after completing my master degree, when I returned back to Turkey, I was directly drafted first uh, Marine school for three months where I started as 220 pounds, and then I finished as 180 pounds. And after that, I'd spend all my rest of my one year service in Afghanistan, in Kandahar, as a joint Turkish, American, Canadian, and British Marine forces over there in Kandahar as a quick reaction force officer. By the way, if there are any Canadians, I would like to send my best greetings to you for what? When I got wounded in Afghanistan, I was taken care by. Canadian health officers over there. So if I'm able to walk today, that's because of the some good knooks over there. So thank you guys for your support in Afghanistan as well. And of course, we're a member of NATO since 1952. So guys, why should we travel to Turkey? That's kind of like a people always ask me when I travel, especially to US and sometimes a part of the Europe. Number one thing, of course, if you're a history buff, Turkey is a really great place. And we have some amazing archeological sites. And when we travel, when we drive in between the two cities, I can easily tell you, hey guys, this is the place where Alexander the Great and the Darius III had a big battle. This is the place of Battle of Ipsos. Can you imagine that? This is the Buddha battle shaped all the world history. Or when you walk around the Troy, or when you walk around the Gallipoli, by the way, you can see the, all the places where history shaped and created. That's why it is quite interesting. Oh, many people, they love shopping in Turkey. It's kind of like, and the products or bazaars are really amazing. You can imagine that in Istanbul, we have the Grand Bazaar, Spice Markets, Arasta Market, and all, when you go over there, you don't need to shop. Just enjoy and leave yourself with the colors, quantity and quality of the items. And you really appreciate how the handicraft really affects the culture. And maybe you wanna end it up with some beautiful pieces as a souvenir to yourself. But I think what really makes the turkey distinguish is the local people. And everybody, which I guided, their unique command about the Turkey were the genuine people. People are so friendly. People are so easygoing. And people are always smiling. Yeah, this is something which we still have common. I think maybe we're still not really professional in travel industry, or maybe we don't see the people as a professional travelers. We just see the people coming to stay with us or join us or coming and sitting in our restaurant as or friends as, or the God, guest of the God. And this is how people welcome them. For example, in our tours with Berna and with Anne, we always visit the one local house in Cappadocia. And imagine that like we do 15 days tours in Turkey. We visit Ephesus, we do Hader Bulling in Cappadocia, we visit Hagia Sophia. Can you see the, how the names are so big? And at the end of the tour, in my final din dinner, 
and I always ask people, hey guys, what's this something or somewhere touch you most? Everybody talks about this small, lovely village family who welcomed us in Cappadocia and share their daily lunch with us, which is kind of like an amazing thing. The people are so like a genuine. I'm a Turkish, but I'm a different Turk. I don't smoke. 70% of the country, they're like a walking chimneys. But if the subject is hookah, oh my gosh, I want everybody to try. It's a kind of like a, a really funny local experience. And in a different part of the Istanbul, this is by the way, the Galata Tower, you can see, we have hookah bars where none, of course, not during the COVID period, but in a non-COVID period, even you're a non-smoker, it's just like the fun to be inside. Can you imagine like a, I took so many celebrities here. I took like a Diana Kroll, I took Tom Hanks, Paul Allen, who was the one of the head of the Microsoft, Alan Greenspan and his wife, Andrew Mitchell, and nobody even recognized them. And people just sometimes, hey, you don't to hold it properly. Come and hold it with that way. And people always feel comfortable when they walk in the streets of Istanbul. But the bad news, if you have any intention to come to Turkey, you either start exercise two months before or you better like a kind of do a long diet when you return back your home because it's a country of food. It's a country for foodies. For example, this is a country where famous with the casseroles and eggplant is the god of the vegetables in this country. We can make so many different foods from those eggplants. Seafoods, it's heaven. Three sides of the country surrounded by the, all the gorgeous fruits of the Mediterranean Sea, and this is how we treat the octopus. But nobody can compete with us in the lamb shank. This is the country of the lamb, and this is the country of kebabs. We have more than 300 type of kebabs. We can even add hashish or pistachio inside the kebab. And when sometimes like I ask my tour, tour members, I call them as a family, hey guys, do you want to try some hashish kebab? And everybody say, what? But it's a really hashish seeds you add and it gives a nice sour taste. And generally in the concept of kebab, always 50% beef, 50% lamb. It's a mixture of this great combination. Look at in the Western uh, part of Turkey in Bodrum, they are very renowned with doing the octopus carpaccio. It's gonna make you hungry again, probably lunchtime for any people. And this is our famous Turkish delight, which is always served with a nice Turkish coffee as a good starter of a day as well. And what is this? or one of the most popular dessert we call as knafa. It's a two layers of shredded wheat inside. In the middle, there's a halloumi cheese. And then after that, when we grill them in a special pan, we first pour honey syrup, water and honey mix, and then a chunk of pistachio, grinded pistachio, and then the huge chunk of a buffalo milk clotted cream. Oh my gosh, this is one of the yummiest thing in our earth. So, which means the food is really an experience in this country. And Turkish wines are getting very popular. I would like to talk about it within a couple of minutes about that subject as well. So in Turkey, it's, it's a huge geography, but transportation is amazing. We are really sophisticated in that case. And generally when we, talk about traveling to Turkey, we always recommended people for major reasons, a must-see place. And after that, also southern eastern part of Turkey, the eastern part of Turkey are another attraction points as well. And of course, number one, and the most famous one is Istanbul, aka the Constantinople. This is kind of a, was the capital of Roman Empire, Eastern Roman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire for almost 1600 years. And of course, that's why when you walk around the streets, you can see the traces of all the three different mega empire, the bazaars, the markets, the great food and restaurants, and the Bosphorus itself, 
in the, the famous water stray, it takes her attraction a lot. But let's start with the, the top of the palace, the house of the sultans, Ottoman sultans. It was built after the fall of Constantinople and almost 450 years, it became a home of the all well-known sultans and almost in 16th and 17th century, where the Ottomans were the superpower of the whole world history. This is the place where they control the world. And it's scattered around the 60 acres area. It was built and reflects the nomadic lifestyle of Turkish people. It was built as kiosk by kiosk, rather than typical European palaces where you can see a one long structure, a couple of hundred yards long, and it was built by lots of independent kiosks as well. But once you get in a palace, especially in some private sections, oh, the wall decorations, the tiles, the three 400 years old amazing woolen silk carpets, the chandeliers. And when you visit the treasury, you can see the world fifth largest diamond in the world, like over there. These are all the fest to your eyes as well. And of course, in this palace, we have the world's most famous harem, which is a place where sultan's concubines and their royal uh, queen mother, they used to live with the sultan's private condos as well. It's kind of like an amazing experience and see the tiles. They all look like an hanging uh, silk carpets on the wall. Those are special Iznik tiles. Iznik is actually the very well-known biblical city, Nicaea, where the Crete was created in the Nicene Council. But in the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries, it became a very important tile production center as well. I don't know, guys, have you ever heard that Turkey is the, and Istanbul is the famous with their cats. We're the cat lover society. And we get an even Oscar nominated foreign movie called Cats of Istanbul. And in the top of the palace, there are almost 40 cats, 15 street stray dogs. They're all taken care by the guards of the palace. So nearly every museum, they have their own cats and they get their on dogs as well. Hagia Sophia, we can just make it as a one presentation subject and I can easily talk about at least two hours in this building. It was built in sixth century AD and only few restorations were added in 16th century, a thousand years later. Today, if we have St. Peter in Rome, St. Paul in London and Duomo in Florence, and Sevilla Cathedral, they all get their prototype and model from Hagia Sophia. Same thing for the Islamic architecture. If we have Taj Mahal, Suleymaniyah Mosque and Selimia Mosque, these are the three major well-known mosques in the world. They all get their inspiration and the model from Hagia Sophia as well. So imagine that it was built in the sixth century AD, 1500 years old, and almost for a thousand year, this was the biggest church of whole Christendom. And still this dome is intact. And once you got inside, when you look at through the apps, you see the mother Mary and infant Christ. You can see some Islamic decorations because 950 years, it was used as a church, basilica church, cathedral. 450 years, it was used as a mosque. And then for 84 years, it was an official museum. And in last one year, it's open for public. Pray again, the good news, it's quickly repaired and restored. And nowadays, there's no restriction. You can try to visit it any time in the day, even in midnight with no entrance fee. And when you look at uh, this amazing structure, look at the huge dome. This dome is 1500 years old. And I wanna give you an idea about the height. It's roughly 186 feet, forget about the number. Bring Miss Liberty from New York. She can easily do a jumping jack underneath of it. Forget about the Miss Liberty, bring Notre Dame from France, Paris, and you can rebuild the whole Notre Dame underneath of the stone. That gives you an idea about 
the greatness of the structure. And of course, every museum we get our own cat. And this is the guard of Hagia Sophia. Her name is Glee. And Glee was almost 15 years was the guard of Hagia Sophia. This year, unfortunately, we lost her. She passed away. She was buried in the garden with the ceremony of almost 2,000 people. Can you imagine that? One cat was take, get a funeral for thousands are following her, but her family, almost 12 other cats, they are the real official owners of Hagia Sophia over there. And you can see the great world mosaics of Jesus Christ of Pantocrator. Again, Jesus the Almighty with the Mother Mary or infant Christ with Mother Mary figures in this amazing building. And roughly uh, 200 yards out of Hagia Sophia, opposite of Hagia Sophia, you will see the Blue Mosque. And it was built in 17th century, 1100 years later. It was much smaller. This Blue Mosque can easily fit also in Hagia Sophia, but it is very intricately decorated. When you look at the walls, you see beautiful blue tiles, or you can easily see beautiful paintings. Whole aim of this intense decoration was to create the Garden of Eden in the interior of building. That's the, one of the purpose of Islamic arts as well. So you can see my term members, I think those ladies are all from Hawaii. And in order to visit the mosques in Turkey, you just need to put the long sleeves, long trousers, and you have to cover yourself with the scarves and then you can be part of the community and the traveler over there. You can see my different groups outside of Hagi, the Blue Mosque area and also my tour guide colleagues. In every two year, I lead a tour in Turkey for the guides of Rick Steves because I've been a senior guide of Rick Steves. And Rick always says one interesting thing. If you wanna learn Greece, Italy, and then the rest of the Europe and understand, you have to start it from Turkey. Once you learn and digest the Turkey, you can easily understand the whole the concept of the Europe and the evolution of the European culture as well, which is a right approach. And the one final shot, the Blue Moss. Now, this is Bosphorus. And one of the interesting activity we always do is the cruising around the Bosphorus. So what is the best way to describe? Look at the picture. The lower left part is the end of the Europe. The upper right part is the beginning of the Asia. So have you ever been in a city which takes place within the two continents? One side is Europe, the one side is Asia. And the Bosphorus is a special strait in between the Black Sea and the part of the Mediterranean Sea, which is called Sea Marmara. So it's basically 16 miles, almost like in 28 kilometers long. And some parts are like a one and a half miles width. Some parts are only 600 yards. And on the Bosphorus, you see a lot of beautiful mansions, beautiful palaces. And those properties are over $100 million worth. Most of the people living in these properties are the people with generally old money. That's what we refer. And you can see some of my tour members, there's so many beautiful restaurants, bars and the hotel, like hotels around the Bosphorus. And we're just doing in the late afternoon, after having an intense day in Istanbul, we're enjoying with the view of the old town, the Bosphorus, the Golden Horn, and sipping our beautiful Turkish wines in a second. And, are you ready to go to Grand Spice Market? Anna? I am. It's like my favorite place. I love it. I love, love, it. <laughs> love Spice Market. You remember I told you before, I still shop in a spice market in a place where my grandpa, grandma, and my parents shop. And like my parents are, my dad is 92, that mom is like in, 86, but like they don't do this shopping anymore, the spice market, but I still go and get their spices from there, from the same family. 
And my son, when I go there, my son is seven years old. I take him there and they love him so much. Probably he's going to keep the family tradition. And it's kind of thing. That's the real richness about the uh, abundance of the spice market. So ladies and gentlemen, what is basically the spice market? This is a place created in late 16th, early 17th century. So many spices and valuable products coming from Asia. And Istanbul was a distribution center, but every different items were sold in a kind of huge different spots. So in order to keep and organize them, they built that specific market just for the spices. And some of the spices were from the Egypt. And that's why they started to call this place in Turkish language as Egyptian markets. It's an L-shaped structure. One side is 180 yards. The other part is like a 220 yards. And you see the world's most beautiful saffrons, figs, and different things. And basically in US and Canada, guys, the saffron is kind of like a ripoff. I checked the prices in Costco, Trader Joe's, and unfortunately in Whole Foods. I love Whole Foods. They make the best clam chowder. This is something I'm craving right now. But anyway, it's basically it's expensive than gold. And in Turkey, my two members, they say that the price of saffron and good Iranian saffron is four times cheaper than the ones in US or like a kind of Canada. So it's amazing. And you can see the all the herbal teas, you can see the dry fridge. And the interesting thing, once you go anywhere, they let you taste. So they give you a small spoon and then they take their own spoons and you take from their small spoons and then you can taste at least 30, 40 different spices or they, even any kind of tea you show, they can bring some hot water and they let you taste it. It's kind of like an experience. And when I do my tours, I will always like to take people and to give an idea about a little bit spice and Turkish light tastings. So they can taste, smell all these things. They are really like a kind of, I try to do it before the lunch so people can really fit themselves with all that small snacks as well. Wow, this is another long subject, but I'm going to keep it short. The Grand Bazaar is really a really authentic part. And it's kind of like the oldest and the largest shopping mall of the world. It's a culture. And I always like a, give my guests a guided tour. I don't give them the free time. I give them a guided tour. And before starting a guided tour, I always do Hegel 101 lectures. And then after the guided tour, I'll leave them away. Hey. You get an hour and I'll free time, enjoy or join me for a tea and coffee. It's a kind of like another colorful experience in the country. So guys, after enjoying in Istanbul for a couple of days, minimum two days, maximum whole month. And uh, it takes an hour and 15 minutes flight to Eastern part of Turkey and you can reach Cappadocia. Cappadocia looks like a Grand Canyon or kind of hoodies in New Mexico. It's a volcanic area. And how many times have you been there, Anna? Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> I've been almost like a 400 times. Not enough. I'm, I missed that. And I'm probably going to go to Cappadocia within the two or three weeks. I want to do that. And once you go over there, you see a lot of like a cave pillars underground cities, rock carved church with some amazing frescoes from 12th and 13th centuries and in some really indigenous people. But also this is the center of the hot air ballooning and it's a really great activity. It's probably, I did in Tanzania and Napa Valley as well. The, the prices in Napa Valley are crazy and same thing for the Tanzania and in Turkey, it's like a much reasonable, nowadays the average price is around the 250 US dollars. It's a really interesting, amazing activity. And once you join and we can do a lot of hikings, nature walks, and in between the, those valleys, which you can also observe them with the balloons as well. And you can, it's a kind of heaven for photographers. So you can enjoy some all kind of funny pictures as you see in here. But as I told you before, my most important experience is the visiting the house of two ladies who speak 
only one English word, hello, but make you the most comfortable visitors. And they're so genuine. They're so lovely. Berna, you've been there several times as well. What yeah, do you think? Like, you should try this one. This is the best. And it's kind of like, an, I just call really them good foot. <laughs> 10 and days ago. Still like, because the elder lady, she was over 96, 97. I just asked, how was she? They said, well, in Turkish, we way to describe this, like a stone, strong and hard. And she's good. She's a solid lady. So ladies and gentlemen, you can see a few more pictures from our gorgeous lens of the beautiful horses, the Cappadocia. From Cappadocia region, within an hour and a 15 minutes flight, you can arrive to Izmir and one hour bus drive through the south, you can get the Kushadasa. It's a beautiful summer resort. It's still Turkey's largest cruise port where a lot of cruise ships comes. Why do lots of cruise ships were coming to small town? This is main reason is Ephesus. So this is something which I've been in Ephesus almost 2000 times. Every time I get in that city, my goose, how do you guys call it in English? My goosebumps goes up. It's kind of like an experience. And it's a one complete Roman city. It's especially this, you see the, all the parts of the typical daily life of the Romans. You can understand that. And you can see the actual latrines. You can see the temples, the parliaments, the marketplaces. Just give you an idea. It is biblically so important, like in a theater where Paul had a big conflict with the silversmith Demetrius, or you can just see in the streets where people were doing their shopping, or you can see the small sized temples or some monuments around the city of Ephesus as well. And this is the parliament of Ephesus where I was talking about a little bit the history of this great place where lots of important things happen. And the Celsus library, this is probably one of the most aesthetic structure. If you ever been in Jordan, in Petra, the treasure building is exactly the same, come from the same architectural form. One was carved in the cliffs of the uh, edge of the cliffs and the walls of the cliffs. The other one is a freestanding with the marble and the cementum of the Romans, beautiful structure. In a real same area in a Ephesus, just like a couple of miles away, we have huge, a great deal size of vineyards. And this is one thing we love to do with Perna. We love to take people to wine tasting. Viniculture is a big thing and it's growing a lot. And now compared with 20 years ago, the wine consumption, wine production is just like a tripled up. And by the way, the wines on the upper left are the Turkish wines today you can find in Whole Foods. So now even the Turkish wines are in international markets as well. And there are so many big, small local villages. There's one called Shirinje. I would love to go and visit that place and see the small handicrafts of the local ladies getting some goat milk ice cream, which is another great Turkish experience. And the next day, if you just drive two and a half hours through the inlands in Aegean Sea, you pass from millions of olive and fig and pomegranate trees, and you reach the Aphrodisias, the city of Aphrodite. This is an amazing ancient city with, you can see some perfect Roman structures like the previous one in here. You see the stadium on your lower left. This is probably most well-preserved stadium in the world. It's three times bigger than the stadium in Olympia in Greece and is much intact than Circus Maximus of Rome and only a few ones in, one in Jerash in uh, Jordan can com make compete with them and there's no restoration even in that one. Look at the video of those official entrances and Basically another an hour and a half drive, you reach the Hieropolis and Pamukkale. That's the interesting part of Turkey guys. And those beautiful structures, we call them as travertines, were only 20,000 years old. 
the springs over there are 100 Fahrenheit, at least like a 42 degrees is a hot water and they contain calcium bicarbonate. And when they go out of the surface, they make a chemical reaction with the oxygen in the air and they create carbon monoxide, which means less of the old calcium is left as deposit. And those calcium deposits, they created all this cascade pools, uh, stalactites and stalagmites too. And from Pamukkale, these are all in the Western part of Turkey. If you get three hours drive, you reach the beautiful town called Bodrum. And the Bodrum itself is like a peninsula in my hand. And the Bodrum town is in this southeast part. And it, there are nearly seven resorts around the peninsula. But the Bodrum town is the historical and gastronomical center of the whole peninsula itself. And the structure you see right now is uh, St. Peter Castle, which was built by the hospitalers of St. John the Baptist in 15th century. But how did they build that? They took to all the stones of mausoleum of Halicarnassus, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. If you look at the picture, can you see a big mosque, white mosque with a minaret nearby the seaside? And behind that, on the right hand side, there's a green area. And this green area is the place once the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, 150 feet, a giant tower like a structure standing. And in the 14th century, an earthquake tumbled it down. And the crusaders, they took all those pieces and rebuilt this fascinating castle. But the Bodrum town is also famous with shipbuilders, but they are not there like a big industrial ships. These are all the traditional ships called gulets. These are beautiful wooden boats. And we do daily or we do two, three, four days cruises with those gulets in a different base in a small coast where probably you are the only boat, enjoy and swim and relax, get the benefits of the Aegean Sea, maybe taste the octopus or the sea bass coming from over there. This is something a must do. And by the way, it's a shark free waters. When it's raining in the, in the Aegean Sea, we don't see the big sharks as well. The one thing I love around the Bodrum territory is is a roughly 45 minutes away from Bodrum in the inland, there's a beautiful local Turkoman village. Those Turkoman people were old nomads, but they've been living in this village almost for 400 years. And once we go over there, we join their daily life. We visit their coffee house, we visit their houses, and this is the place where people still do act active carpet weaving. And we learn how to cook the food. So that's a, we joined two different cooking demos and one cooking lesson here. After learning how to make the Turkish filo doughs, we also sit together with these ladies and fill the green pepper and eggplant and prepare dolma for us. And then also the other ladies, the masters teach, show us and teach us how to put the famous Turkish double nuts in their carpets we we'll learn about them. And then we visit and we get our lunch. We experience their local wines and people in there also free time. If they want, they can look at the, those beautiful handicrafts. Why I love this place. You can get and get beautiful carpets in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul, but there are lots of middlemen. Those people are the producers, not only price wise, but it's an experience to see and meet with your, even your own weaver. That's one thing I like about this village and this art where the real people support. So guys, that's a general thing what we do nowadays in Turkey and still people like to travel in this part of the country, but also Eastern Turkey offers to you a lot. And it's a kind of huge civilization over there. And can you imagine that in the Eastern part of Turkey, we have two city, Antioch, which is a well-known biblical Antioch. Yeah, this is the place where first time the Peter carved the cave and conduct the big sermon. And this is a city where the people of believer of Christ first time ever called Christians. And this is a city where Luke was born. 
And can you imagine that? And in that city and in the city of Mardin, where we have people, guys, they still speak Aramaic, the language of Jesus Christ. It's ethnically very mixed. We get Arabs, we get Armenians, we get Christians, Jews, we got everybody living in this part. And you see a lot of like interesting architecture. That this is Pearl of Middle East, Martin, with a beautiful architecture. And its whole city is under the UNESCO World Heritage Protection Program over there. And this is a small pictures from the city of Urfa, where the lake over there you can see with a beautiful mosque, according to Islamic belief, where Prophet Abraham make a big miracle, where King Nimrod put him in a fire, he turned all the fire into the lake and all wood pieces turned into the fish. And that's also a place where he get married with Sarah and that's why they call them as a city of the uh, prophets. And then you can see the Turkish Alborabello. If anybody been in the Alborabello of Italy, the conical like a kind of beehive houses, those are the Turkish Alborabello, the beehouse houses in the southern east Harran, where, which is a very important Old Testament city. And you can see Gebekli Tepe, and you can see our beautiful mix liver and chicken kebab come from that region. So it's kind of like an interesting part as well. Whew, I've been talking for an hour and five minutes and I'm stuck. I hope you enjoyed it, what I showed you guys, but I'm sure I'll be more enjoyed when you ask your questions. I'm a question love type of person. You may always give me a hard time with any questions you like to ask. Wow, oh, thank you. That was amazing, Mert. That was just, uh, I'm wishing I was there with you guys right now. <laughs> but I yeah. always wish that. <laughs> so if anybody wants to ask a question, they can unmute themselves and ask away, or you can put it in the chat box there. What is your contact information? One question, Anna McKay. So, Anna at yourjourney.com. And I'll oh. be sending, uh, I'll be sending, um, an email out to everybody with um, with a, a recording of the talk. Sorry, I didn't start it at the beginning, and um, just a few updates from from the talk as well. Okay. Anytime. Any questions? I'm really happy to help as well. Uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, you were saying Hagia Sophia is now for a year. Uh, no longer museum. Uh, is it a mosque now or? It's quite interesting. That's a very good question, ma'am. Uh, it is currently a mosque, but just uh, this week is an Easter for Christians. And I have a friend who was leading a Romanian group who are the members of the Romanian Orthodox Church. When they went to Hagia Sophia, they met with the Imam and Imam gave them a small corner and they make their own practice over there. Okay. As long as we keep the tolerance, why not? It's right. just like, a, it's better to call it as a house of a God. Yeah, well, thank you very much. You're, you're, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation and I enjoyed the places that I've seen. I've seen quite a few of those that you mentioned. Uh, I was in Turkey in 2002 and I was there for three, three weeks and I had a wonderful time. Yeah. And I still would like to see many places. You're a big country, and this, mm. but I was, uh, I really love being there. Thank you. You have a wonderful country. All right. He, somebody asked, like, is Troy or Hattushesh included? Yeah, when we design the programs, we may add uh, through the mostly Troy, because again, in Hattusha, it's a little bit far away from Cappadocia, and you have to drive two hours north of Ankara, which is four hours away from the Cappadocia. But for the private tours, Aptusha is always as a pre or post can be at, but Troy is generally on the route and it's a very important Bronze Age settlement and there's a huge story, the Homer's Iliad. That's where like a, and the interesting thing, the story of Iliad and the geography of Troy really overlap. And I always open my book in a Troy the Hamilton version, Iliad, and read the passage and said, look on your left hand side, you see that hill 
You can see that river. You can see those islands. Wow, it really fits. That's why I think Troy is really, really another important spot in Turkey to see. How easy is the travel for vegetarians and vegans, uh, especially for vegetarians? Turkey is a country for veg vegetable lo lovers. Or salads or vegetables, non-cooked meat and- Plus olive oil cooks. <laughs> Exactly, and plus medzes, which yeah. are basically based on olive oil, garlic, and oh vegetables. And so like, and we never get problem. For the vegans, we arrange it, but uh, especially for vegans are a little bit problem in the Eastern part of Turkey. Because in the Eastern part of Turkey, like uh, we better like uh, make our precautions in advance and get our stuff and arrange it. Especially not if you stay in some place. For the, first, lunch. For the lunch, it's a little bit issue. But we can, we deal with that before and we never get any problem. Yeah, I've had I've had vegetarian and vegans in the West and we haven't had a problem. In the West, like in the central parts, we had never ever any problem. Is it things like even we have nowadays in Turkey are very uh, sensitive about this lactose intolerance and also gluten-free. And from any markets, we can always get the gluten-free products and prepare it for our to members as well. Yeah, so we basically can arrange any kind of customized private tour. And as well, Bern and I have been chatting and still fine tuning where we'll be doing a Western and um, Eastern itinerary, just sorting out when it's gonna be. Um, Bern and I have done, I don't know how many tours together with my old company. So we know each other well, and we've also done quite a few private tours. So, and as you can see with Mert, there's so many different angles and so many different things to see in Turkey and we can customize it to what you're, you're focusing on. Uh, hello. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little concerned about the political situation. Um, apart from COVID, I mean, you know how. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, how safe is it? And uh, yeah, are there any kinds of limitations? Um, it seems to be getting worse politically. I don't know. I don't know what happened politically in country so far. Uh, we don't have any riots or at least nobody can go and get a gun in Turkey and shoot you guys. Uh, we don't have a kind of those kind of crimes. Uh, in Turkey, the biggest crime so far we experience is a pickpocketing and the, the last kind of like a big kind of attacks or something's happened in 2016 where we lost 11 people. But uh, apart from that, since 2017, January, we have a very clean record. And also the gun, public guns are not allowed in Turkey, especially mm -hmm. for, I don't know the Canada situation, but I know the second amendment thing in the United States and, oh gosh, you're much safer. And I have a tour member just like a tour four weeks ago and we traveled all the West, a couple from Seattle. And basically they say, in compared with Seattle, Istanbul is like a kind of like a the safest place in the earth. So, oh, for example, if there's a political rally, we don't get into political rally. And we just like, and, and generally political rallies are done only one part of the city. And there's a special designated side, one in European side, one in the Asian side. So that's why like, and, and all the like a protests and everything are done in that region. So be always away from those things as well. And rest of the old city, after this 2016, the terror attack, everywhere with full of security officers, back checks are done in several places. Yeah, there are jammers all around. We are really good with creating and also the public transportations are extremely safe. You get lots of detectors. So, so far, we're doing very well. Thank you. And I have, I, I haven't, I was there 2018, um, but um, 
I traveled way back. I think the first time I was in Turkey was 90, 94 or 95. And every time after that, as um, Mert said in, in his talk there, I have never come across more friendly and accommodating people anywhere in the world. Um, as a single woman traveling through Istanbul, I constantly had people coming up and asking me, not, not, uh, not trying to sell me something, just going, where are you going? Where are you going? Where do you need to go? We can help you. <laughs> and then they'll try to sell you something. But, <laughs> but, they also, but everybody's just so friendly. And especially in the countryside, we were way out. Um, I was actually on a camping on an overland trip the first time I was there. And we'd be in these little villages and everybody would come out and out comes the tea, out comes the coffee, and they just want to sit down and meet you. And, and, that's, and that's it. And um, I found that every time I've been there. And I've always felt safe in Istanbul. Oh, yeah. Oh, in Ramadan, the food, and you have to break the fist with the people. Yes, exactly. That's one of the experience, as Laura mentioned in the chat section. Yeah. It's literally like a, one of my friends who was from Seattle, he just complained that, Merit, we are getting so overwhelmed with too much hospitality. <laughs> So people are so friendly and sometimes like we think, hey, what's behind this? Nothing. And it just like, and you can feel, especially if you go to Cappadocia. If you, yeah, Istanbul is a big city, guys. And you know, in big cities, there are some certain rip parts. You have, to, you have to keep yourself away. I don't go to certain districts of LA and San Francisco when I travel in those cities as well. I know that these are dangerous parts. Same thing happened for Istanbul too, but like, in, People, when they go to out of the city, Istanbul, and go to Izmir, go to Kushada, say, oh my gosh, like, and the world suddenly changed, and people feel like a, so confident and relaxed. That's what they always mention about. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have. Hi. Hi. Uh, I. Uh, I actually really enjoyed this uh, virtual travel presentation. It, it, it felt very nice. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm not exactly a foodie, but I would, I would love to visit the big bazaar in Turkey, which uh, sends a lot of items. And I'm very curious about the evil eye pendant. Uh, I <laughs> guess it's made of glass and sand or something like that. Uh, so is it possible for me to uh, get it from Turkey? Yeah, of, of course. I would like. I would, I would love to visit the country sometime. Maybe after this lockdown thing gets over. But oh, yeah. uh, if I get more info on that particular thing, is it made by the locals or is it made by a certain set of people there, particular religion? It's made by basically the glass masters, and it's supposed to be the good glass one, and what we call as evil eye, or in Turkish nazar. If you go to Israel and Turkey, we call it as Nazar. Greece and something like a kind of same like the Nazar, Nazari or Astari they call. Uh, it keeps the evil and the bad thoughts and the bad energy away from you. But if you look at the beginning of the story and if you get two minutes time, I would like to tell. The beginning of the story is the Greek mythology. You all remember there was a once upon a time in Greek mythology, there was a gorgeous immortal girl called Medusa. She was a beautiful girl, best friends of the goddess Athena. They were doing everything together, but she was exactly, <laughs> thank, thank you Dana for that. And she was a really, really uh, major assistance of God of the gods, Zeus. But when Zeus was cheating his wife, Hera, she, Medusa is the one who was helping her and trying to take care and we covered all the bad things which she is involved with. But one day Hera learned everything. She couldn't do anything to Zeus because he was the Lord of the Lords. So she punished the Medusa. This gorgeous girl suddenly become a guardian, an immortal. And she, the Hera gave her big blue eyes. And anyone looking at the eyes of the Medusa become petrified and become a star. And that's why, again, you know, the story Greeks, in order to break all the bad looks up to Medusa, that's why, again, they get this like a kind of special eyes, which reflects the eyes of the Medusa 
back to her. And then he became a tradition on the Greeks and then become a tradition among the Turks and then the Israelites. So nearly all the big the Middle Eastern societies, we love to keep the evil eye. That's the best AIG insurance without charging any fee from me. <laughs> if you have a newborn baby, you know the, what's the common gift? It's a pin attached with a gold coin with a red ribbon and the evil eye. Evil eye protects the baby from the evil and devil. Red ribbons brings a good luck. And the gold coin is a small contribution to family of the newborn kid. That's how we celebrate it, how we wear it too. It's really interesting. <laughs> really, really interesting. Because I'm coming from it. I'm actually calling from Chennai, which is a city in the southernmost part of India. Great. So, uh, and uh, the last time I heard about Turkey, I mean I just saw a program on a National Geographic and uh, and you know what the presenter said that uh, Turkey is actually a confluence of both the West. It, it, it's more of a blend of the East and the West. It is, so, it is actually, that's the one thing like yeah. when people feel that they feel very comfortable, like they feel themselves at home, but at the, at the same time, they enjoy with lots of authentic and local experiences as well. This is what uh, we got in here. And for example, like in me and Berna, we're all the, we're, we're graduated the same university, which is the oldest American university outside the boundaries of the United States. In, 1863. Imagine like a kind of, but we both come from like a, such a mixed families. Like a, check my nose from profile. You can see that my mom is Jewish. My dad is Muslim, but my dad's family from Crete, which is kind of like a, a kind of another mixed family as well. Berna's family is no, a full, no, uh, full Jewish. No. Yeah. And then Berna is like a full Kohen family. She's a full Jewish. No, I'm Levi. <laughs> oh, you are Levi, sorry. Yeah. Uh, not the Kohen ones. So anyway, like, and we are so mixed. Everyone is so mixed. So that's why, like, and, and in my childhood, I remember that uh, during the Hanukkah, all the neighbors were putting candles to their windows. So <laughs> people were joining you. And now... This is the Eastern for the Greek Orthodox and all the Assyrian church members. Oh my gosh, if you go to any church right now, you can see the Turks carrying the Eastern eggs in their hands to celebrate it with their local neighbors. That's very common. So that's why we, we are very mixed. So like a kind of, people always ask me, Mert, which religion you belong to more? I said, I don't know, <laughs> because I am all of them. My, I'm belonging to all of them, and this is how we grow up. And Berna probably knows Islam more than many people call themselves as Muslim in this country. <laughs> that's another interesting thing. So that's what we are. Thank you for that. We're mixed. Mersh? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Jan Ellis. And um, I was there in a tour with you seven years ago and, and met your little son when he was just a baby Hi. at our last dinner. And we had such a wonderful tour with you. This was so exciting to be here with you again. Can you show your face to me, please? Um, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Are you on phone? Uh, pardon? Are you on phone I'm, and computer? I, I'm on the computer. Uh, there's a video section, like a kind of- uh, the Oh, start my video? Yeah. Yes. I just clicked yeah. on there. Oh, there we go. Well, hey, now let's see. I'll get my face up in here somewhere. Where's my camera? <laughs> yeah. of course, of there course. we go. <laughs> yes, Jen. How are you? Yes. I'm great. And my uh, friend Julie was with me then too. And we had such a wonderful tour with you. And so when this came up, we both said, oh, we have to do this. <laughs> because we wanted to see you again and hear you again. You were so interesting. Only the difference, wait, let me show you for a second. Uh, on the difference, this young boy is becoming like that. He's a blondie. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, look at him. He's wonderful. Very cute. <laughs> That's the other thing, guys. Like, when people come to Turkey, they all expect to see uh, like a kind of brown or black eyed people. We're almost 50% of the country are blue or green eyed. We're such a mixed society. My, my mother is blondie. My brother, if I bring you here, you're going to surprise you. You probably say he is American. 
or he's Swedish. His blondy and blue eyes. I look like my father's mother, more <laughs> criticos, more like a someone from Greek. That's why when I go to Greece, everybody speaks me Greek. When I go to Israel, everybody speaks me Hebrew. <laughs> like when I go to Italy, everybody speaks me Italian. I think I am more Mediterranean. They're more like a kind of their background, probably a little bit Jewish and mixed. I don't know. Nice to see you, Jeanette. After listening to you today, I have to come back to Turkey. There's more I have to see. And I want to see you again. <laughs> oh, you're always welcome. Excellent. Okay, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? No? Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Mert. That was just amazing. And uh, I think we're probably going to do a talk on Eastern Turkey. Oh, so. Norma got a question. No, no, I'm saying goodbye. Wait, goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you guys for coming. I loved it. I loved it. I must go. I must, I must go to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> And you will enjoy the tour with him so very much. And I'm sure so. that Anna I and Berna so. probably give, give the excellent tours also. You're the greatest you, salesman. Man. You're the greatest salesman. <laughs> yes. Goodbye. Um, Thank you. We look forward to seeing you soon here. Yes. <laughs> and you know what? I can't wait to get on the a cruise boat, which much showed you. <laughs> Definitely. Bye-bye. There was one question about Indian sure. visa. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll send a, a note when I send yeah. it, because I'm not sure. Uh, me too, because we get visa while we are traveling to India, but I think Indians get the visa on uh, when they arrive. When they arrive, there is no visa. they get the e-visa, fair enough. I just send it to you. For Canadians and e Americans as well, they get e-visa online, which is a North Americans $20. Canadians, I don't know why it's $50. I know. Yes, Marion, what's your question? The last yes. question. Yes, I'm sorry for the last question. I had- oh, No problem, please. I was planning on going to Istanbul uh, mid-September of this year after a tour of the Balkans, you know, Albania, um, uh, Belgrade, those places. And I canceled it because even though I'm fully vaccinated, it seems that things are a little um, uncertain there uh, in Istanbul with the COVID. So I was wondering if you had any insight. I mean, nobody has a crystal ball for September. Yeah. Oh, well, Marius, that's one thing I, like a turkey started uh, COVID did very well, but uh, last two and a half months, we get a little bit shaked, but our vaccination rate is going very well. Almost one quarter of the population vaccinated. And I'm talking Turkey is a big country with 84 million people, plus the refugees, we're almost like 90 million. So, so far 25 million people vaccinated and I get COVID. And then one of the greatest thing is our public health system. People are really taking care and one of my friends get an Indonesian guest. The guest get a COVID and well taken care in the hospital and she was released too. So oh, we're expecting this summer, we're going to be heavily injected, vaccinated and probably in September and October, uh, it's going to be much easy to travel in and much safer to travel in Istanbul and the rest of the Turkey. For example, this May, at the end of the May, I have people coming from Rick Steves and I have uh, inspectors of the Carnival Cruise Lines, Holland American Line, Princess Cruise Line and Windstar. They're all belonging to Carnival Group. They're coming to inspect at Istanbul and Kushanese and I'll be their inspection guide. So I'll be with those people. So that's why like, and you can always get most updated information via Anna because Anna always, always keep in touch with us. And I can always like inform her and Berna regularly. So what's going on and what's gonna be their policy? I think they're gonna give us a lot of indication, but the last, uh, last week I was with Rick Steves on the uh, Zoom with meeting with him and he was 
eager to run everything in mid-September if the France and Spain also open. So like, and that's something like all the corporates, they have their own policies, but now I don't like my government and president, <laughs> but I like the their <laughs> approach. Yeah, I, and just take this part out. You can, no problem. <laughs> I like their intense work and efforts. So for example, as you know, Pfizer Biotech,